Now, in our last class, we were talking about Adler and personality types. And we had just finished talking about the ruling type. And you will remember that the ruling tri type is a person who really has control of a relationship. And we had just pointed out that that ruling type person most often would marry someone who's very passive. That that relationship actually can work as long as the people stay the same way. But we finished, you know, by saying when th where things go wrong is when the passive person really begins to experience, I could be more. I don't really have to be this way. And of course, as soon as that person changes, that creates a lot of conflict in the, in the person who is the ruling type who experiences that he or she is losing control. Now, the next person or type we're going to talk about is the, avoid, uh, is the, uh, the getting type. And Adler actually thought that the getting type was the, the, actually the most frequent type of person you encounter. Uh, this is someone who expects everything from others and leans on people. This is the individual whose orientation is such that they do whatever is necessary so others will do for them what the persons feel they need. Uh, in other words, these, these are situations in which, while relationships occur, they're, they're really selfish. The whole idea of being in a relationship is, what can I get from this? Even in things as intimate as sex, the idea with sex is not that I am trying to provide pleasure for another person, but rather, I am trying to make this person feel good about me so they will do other things for me. And, and the real focus is the other things that people will do for me. Sex is just a means. If I have to do that, I'll do that. <clears throat> if I have to do something else, I'll do that. But I'm never really doing it because I'm concerned about someone else. I'm doing it because I'm seeking things for me. Then the third group is the avoiding type. Now, this group is inclined to feel successful by avoiding the solution to problems. This person tries to sidestep problems in an effort to avoid conflict, or maybe in, in the most extreme, uh, the person is trying to avoid what they might feel as some kind of defeat for themselves. So, this is an individual who procrastinates tries to get others to make decisions. But he wants these decisions to have flexibility so that they could allow for multiple changes. For example, let's say that you're going to go to the movies. This person would say to you, you choose. And you say, OK, we're going to go see A. Then the person says to you, well, what about B? And you say, well, yeah, OK, B is good. And the person will say, good choice. We'll go to see B. Well, this person has given you the impression you actually chose what movie we're going to go see. But in effect, this individual chose. And, and so it's, it's a very manipulative kind of approach to, uh, to being with people. That is, on one hand, it seems very passive, but the avoiding type is not necessarily passive. That is, what they're really trying to do is they don't want to be responsible, but they might be very active in manipulating the situation. So things tend to happen the way they would like them to happen, although someone else is always taking responsibility. Now, the fourth type uh, that we had in our, our <coughs> the uh, table we had up is the socially useful type. And this type struggles to a greater or less extent for a solution to problems which actually will be useful to others. In Adler's theory, obviously, 
this was the healthiest approach. For example, this, it, this kind of person sees service as a real service to others as a real aspect of their job. Uh, this is the, the person who sends a child to college because they really and truly want the, that child to be advantaged, to be better, to have a good experience, not because the parent feels I owe it to the child, not because the parent feels I myself will get a lot of gratification because I have a child in college but rather because the person really feels the child will be better and society will be better. Now, in Adler's activity and social interest concepts, one finds that our first type, that is the ruling type, there is considerable activity, but little social interest. So we had said before that, that activity and social interest, you know, are the keys for Adler. But depending on the type, activity or social interest may dominate uh, or it may be almost missing. In the ruling type, for example, this person acts in an unsociable way. And usually when things go negatively, uh, these people can become delinquents, tyrants, even sadists. So the ruling type, there are benign ways for the ruling type, as, as we've talked about, but there also are some very negative consequences that can happen. It, the, by the way, this also uh, can be directed against oneself. So, so in, the, in this role, uh, it's also possible with the ruling type that the person might become suicidal, uh, might be a drug addict or an alcoholic, uh, because it's, it's the only way they can get control of things. It is a very bad way to get control of things. It is a very bad way to be ruling, but it is a way. And since these people tend to be lower on activity, they would tend to attach to other people indirectly. Now then if you take the second and third types, like the getting type and the avoiding type, these people show even less activity and they don't show a lot of social interest if you notice my descriptions of them. Adler felt that the results were that these people became neurotic. He even thought in some extreme situations they became psychotic. Now, in the fourth type, the socially useful type, he felt we could always find a certain amount of activity and that activity is used for the benefit of others. Thus, as already mentioned, this really was Adler's view of the healthy person. And again, you'll notice because uh, of his work, you know, being a psychiatrist, he didn't think this was the dominant uh, way that people related. But he did feel that of the choices that exist, there is a choice that is very healthy and that he would hope people would aspire to. And of course, it would be one of the goals of therapy is to get people uh, to be that kind of person. Now, Adler did not enunciate a series of developmental stage. Uh, if you will recall, as we said earlier, uh, his emphasis was on a holistic theory. And this caused him really to focus more on concepts and to elaborate how an individual used certain abilities to deal with various problems. And he did believe that there were three negative factors that threatened the child's development and especially that threatened the child's development of self-esteem and social interest. And you'll see in our table that the first of these he called organ inferiorities and childhood diseases. He believed that children may easily become self-centered, lose hope of playing a useful part uh, in our common life, and consider themselves humiliated by the world if they experience organ inferiority or childhood diseases. That is, the child can, 
develop a sense that I don't have what it takes. And he was concerned about this because, of course, this happens early in life. So at the very beginnings of life, the child feels, I don't have what it takes to be socially useful. And for Adler, being socially useful was paramount. And he also said that a pampered child has been trained to receive without giving. So he thought this person has lost independence and does not know what he or she can do, that he or she really can do things for themselves because everybody else is always doing it for them. And so social interests and ultimately self-esteem are low. And this combination really makes a person prone to failure. And, you know, it, if you think about yourself, uh, you know, all of us at times uh, really like the idea of being pampered. Uh, it's nice that somebody takes care of us. And in an adult world, it's fine if someone pampers you. Uh, uh, because at times it means, you know, when you've worked hard and you've been productive and you're doing all kinds of things, it's nice to come home and somebody takes care of you. Uh, someone is nice to you uh, and you're allowed to be passive. It's not that kind of pampering that Adler is concerned about. Adler is concerned that from the beginning of life, a child is so pampered, the child doesn't develop, first of all, an awareness that there are other people out there and the child doesn't develop an awareness that they can do things. That is, that they can be creative in their life. So it is the pampering very early in life uh, that becomes a problem. And, and you do want to distinguish this now from, from being nurturing and caring of a child. There really is a difference between uh, caring for a child, allowing a child to feel warm, feel loved, feel special, feel good, and failing as a parent to help that child to realize you must do some things for yourself. And it is not just we that give to you, but you must learn to give back to us. You must learn to be a productive person in society. And, and that means there are some limits to what you can have. And, uh, and you'll see uh, later on when we talk about some types, how uh, excessive pampering probably uh, creates in some personalities a serious limitation. Now he also was concerned about neglect and he thought the neglected or worse hated or unwanted child has found society cold. Now if, if those are your first experiences in life that is surely how you're going to find society. So the individual then will become suspicious of others and the person will be unable to trust others but also they may be unable to trust himself or herself. Adler thought that, that actually many failures in life come from orphans and illegitimate children. And he said that because, uh, you know, in his day, uh, as a psychiatrist, of course, if he were to treat people who were orphans or illegitimate children, they would have problems already. So he probably overgeneralized this. But he did think that such children try to escape and they try to get a safe distance from people who harm them, uh, people who are rejecting of them, that their, their life in many ways is one of flight. Now, under all three of the circumstances that we described in our table, that is, the child has organ inferiorities or the child is overly pampered or the child is neglected, he thought that the child will develop what he called a pampered style of life, which he saw as the actual predisposing position for failure later in life. It's characterized, as we described, by expecting from others, uh, by pressing others into service for you, by evading responsibility, by blaming circumstances for one's own personal shortcomings. Uh, and what's important is that underneath all of this, this individual actually feels incompetent and insecure. 
And, and so with that combination of feelings, uh, Adler would predict this person is going to fail in life. Now, there were some interesting things, though, that Adler felt could happen. Uh, for instance, he thought that individuals with defective organs typically attempted to overcome their weakness by intensive training. So he didn't start off with the thesis, you know, if something happened in your life that, that you were born with some abnormality, well, that, that's it, folks. He thought, actually, most people will try to overcome that and, and that that's good. And, and of course, this is an observation you might expect a physician to make because the physician would be seeing people uh, who had such problems. But what Adler did was to universalize this in a way that as if most of us lived our lives like this, and, and that was overshooting uh, this issue. He noted, though, that, that we are unique in how we attempt to compensate, but that feelings of inferiority that we have lead us to strive for superiority as a means of overcoming it. Now, this is not a bad thing. Uh, I mean, if, if you feel something is about yourself is inadequate and you actually struggle to overcome it, that's a very positive kind of approach. And, and he felt, Adler felt that therefore, you know, it's not any defect that one would have that is really the problem. It's really the attitude you develop towards whatever defect uh, you have, that that becomes the problem. And, uh, and so some people will get passive and the defect really will become major in their life other people will overcome it. Now, now really, you know, in terms of overcoming uh, problems, th there, there are some marvelous examples. One of them, uh, really amazing one, was in the 1994 Olympics. And I don't know how many of you might have, or, or, or if any of you are, have an avid interest in the Olympics, but if you do, you might remember that there was a woman named Evelyn Ashford. Evelyn Ashford, in the 1994 Olympics, won the 100-meter dash. And, of course, if you win the 100-meter dash, you're seen as being the fastest woman in the world. Evelyn Ashford had bad feet. She had all kinds of trouble with her feet. So much so that only two years before the Olympics, Physicians had a serious talk with her about whether they should amputate her feet. So here is somebody who is faced at a point in her life with the possibility that her feet have become such a problem she might lose them. Two years later, she wins the gold medal in the 100 meter dash in the Olympics. I mean, a really extraordinary example of how you know, someone can be faced with an issue. Someone can be faced with something that might seem to be inferior, and yet, you know, take on the challenge, and in this case, in, in about as dramatic a way as possible, uh, develop it into a real asset. That is, the, the drive develops into the real asset. Now, there's another actually marvelous example in sports that some of you may remember. There was a young man in North Carolina who goes off for high school basketball. The coach watches him for a while and said, kid, basketball is not for you. You don't have the talent. Uh, you should not play. And the coach cuts the kid. He doesn't make the high school team. Do you know who that was? Everybody knows. Yes, it was Michael Jordan. Here's Michael Jordan, you know, the premier basketball player of all time. And yet, if you look at his history, he's being told, kid, you don't have it. So Adler, you know, saw this. He saw this kind of phenomena. He felt it's one thing to be told uh, that you are not able to do something or that there's a limitation in your life. Like in the case of Evelyn Ashford, that, you know, your feet are in terrible, terrible shape. Uh, we don't know what to do. But what you as an individual choose to do can dramatically change what's going to be the outcome. Evelyn Ashford, I suppose, could have had her feet amputated. Uh, I mean, that would have been a very passive 
uh, giving in to, to this issue, uh, Michael Jordan could have chosen not to pursue basketball anymore. Uh, I mean, instead, you know, the attitude of the person really makes a difference. And, and this is the kind of optimism in Adler's theory that you want to be aware of. Now, Adler also expanded uh, his concept of organ inferiority to, to include exaggerated strivings that are caused by what he said were feelings of unmanliness. And he developed a term called masculine protest. And it's a term that's used to describe compensation behaviors. Now what you have to keep in mind with Adler is that in his theory, superiority tends to be equated with <coughs> traditionally masculine uh, be behaviors. In his world, things like assertiveness and independence and dominance, those were masculine behaviors. And inferiority tended to be equated with tr what he labeled traditionally feminine behaviors. Were, they were such things as passivity, submissiveness, dependency. And, and what you want to keep in mind is that Adler really made these distinctions, uh, you know, really based on the language that was used uh, in his day. That is, these were the stereotypes of how men and women were perceived. Uh, but uh, Adler was not someone who thought that men uh, or that women were not the equal of men. Rather, he felt that uh, both men and women experience the masculine protest and that both strive for these masculine behaviors to resolve problems and to avoid the feminine behaviors we described that could work against real growth. Now, now this aspect uh, of Adler is really not that different from what Jung talked about. Remember, Jung said, everybody has an animus, which were masculine characteristics, and an anima, which were feminine characteristics. And it simply was a matter of how do you develop those aspects of your personality, but that the, the well-developed person uh, in Jung would be developing both the masculine and the feminine aspects of personality, but some would dominate more than others. Now, as, as Adler extended his theory, he actually broadened his concept of organ inferiority to include all experiences and feelings of both the psychological and a social nature that caused one to feel inferior. Uh, actually beginning with the earliest experiences of family life. So it's a pretty broad concept. And if you think about this, you know, since parents and most others, uh, when you're, you know, very young, are bigger and more capable, he posited that people quickly learn to feel inferior and they strive to overcome these feelings of inferiority by becoming superior. So they're feeling down here, they want to be up here. Now, consistent with his optimism, he felt inferiority can be primarily constructive, and he gave lots of examples, but he also realized that uh, it could be destructive. And he acknowledged that we all feel inferior at some point in our lives, and that actually this can serve as a basis for our seeking help from others. And it can serve as a basis for cooperation, where we overcome our problems in living by working with other people to help us achieve whatever it is we wish to, to achieve. That's however we wish to rise to this level of superiority. Now, two concepts then got introduced. One is style of life, and the style of life and a second concept, the creative self, are very closely interrelated uh, in, Jung, or in Adler's theory. The style of life was at one point called the life plan or guiding image. So style of life is a pretty comprehensive concept. It refers to the unique ways in which people pursue their goals. And, and this concept, by the way, is very important in Adler because he believed that the, uni the unique styles that we develop are primarily formed during the first five years of life. Thus, after age five, 
he saw it as difficult to change uh, one's lifestyle. But he did develop a concept which is called the creative self. And this was a solution to being trapped in the style of life one developed in the first five years of life. That is, you can be creative enough to figure out ways to overcome what happened in those years. So while he emphasized then that there were very important activities that occurred in the first five years of life, he posited there is a way to resolve even profound styles that were developed then and to move towards a truly creative adulthood. So, and, and the reason I want you to, to keep this in mind is because obviously in his therapy, he will do some focusing on those first five years because he's saying those five years are when often you determine uh, what your lifestyle will be. But nothing is so determined that you can't overcome it. And a couple of the examples I gave will show that. Now he introduced something that other theorists had not, and that's birth order. Birth order is perhaps one of the most research areas that, that really flows from Adler's writings. And, and he thinks that uh, birth order is very important. He believed you know, that each child is really treated uniquely by parents. And that often the response of parents is determined by where the child is born into the family. I'm sure th those of you who are parents uh, recognize that, that you, know, you don't respond the same to the second born or the third born as you did to the first born. Uh, so you know, th this is not a hard concept for most people to buy. The stereotype, of course, is that the eldest child tends to be the center of attention. That is, the eldest child is the center of attention until another child is born. Then the eldest child must cope with a certain loss of attention and begin to share for the first time his or her life. At the same time, oldest children are often seen as understanding the importance of power and authority because they have had to undergo losses uh, early in their life. And, and, and losses of power and authority in interacting with their parents. Now, interestingly, such children can also be highly supportive of authority, or they can be dependent on authority in later life because of their sensitivity to issues like power and its possible loss. So the oldest child may have more focus on power and authority than some of the other children. Now, he noted then that second children often experience competitive, competitiveness quite early. And they feel a need to be assertive to survive. And Adler posited that the oldest child, that, that is, if the oldest child is supportive and kind to the second and the third children, these individuals have a much better chance to excel and to experience healthy development. He saw the oldest child as having a real impact on the second and third child. He also said, if the oldest child is hostile uh, to the subsequent siblings, it is not unusual for the siblings to develop neurosis. Now again, we, we have a psychiatrist you know, who is hearing the fantasies of people, and so he develops kind of a, a universal uh, position that really isn't supported by data. But in some cases, this does happen. Adler also posited there is a danger that a second child may set goals that are quite unrealistic and thus ensure a life of feeling inadequate. And yet this is the case, and, and, and you really see this. The second child wants to be like the first child. The first child is bigger, better coordinated, able to do more things. First child, or the second child sees the first child riding a bike. Uh, the second child runs out, wants to jump on the bike. What happens with the second child? Yes, falls. 
crashes. <laughs> the, the second child has fantasies, has desires, but doesn't have the skills yet. So this child is seeing the first child riding off on the bike, doing just fine. Then second child runs out, jumps on the same bike, crashes, uh, you know, scuffs their knee, cuts themselves maybe, uh, feels inadequate. That, that was uh, the problem. And, and the problem uh, that Adler was pointing out is, you know, it's when the second child feels they must be like the first child now that they have problems. If they aspire to be like the first child, that's fine. But when parents don't help them to, to kind of mediate reality so that they, that they do things when they're ready to do them, then the second child can feel inferior. Now, Adler posited that the youngest child most often is the most pampered and may become highly dependent on nurturance and gratification. And we said that about the pampered child just a minute ago. Thus, he posited that the child may be excessively dependent. And this individual may also develop an unrealistic appreciation of how difficult it is to achieve goals that he or she wants. After all, if everything's being given to you, it's not a big deal. Uh, so you don't think achievement is hard. Uh, if, the, if the pampered child has everything given to him or her, then that's what they learn to expect. So that's how they approach life. Now, Adler also addressed the only child phenomena, knowing that, that such a person, of course, is the center of attention in a family and that such a person likely experiences much pampering and may experience considerable interpersonal difficulty later if the individual is not universally liked or admired since this was their position in the family. And I'm sure you've seen this with, uh, you know, certainly I have seen uh, only children who are actually very bright, very talented, uh, really accomplished, uh, you know, doing really good things and, 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 and are very popular. I mean, they've developed good social skills. But as soon as you don't give that person what that individual wants, they get angry, they are offended. It's almost like they're saying, don't you know who I am? I am a person that everybody takes care of. Uh, nobody denies me anything. How can you say no to this? And this is where people have difficulty in their jobs because they are so accustomed to getting everything that if they're in a situation where they don't get everything, uh, they don't do well. These also, by the way, are people who like, don't do well on teams uh, unless they're, they're the star of the team. So if someone has an extraordinary, uh, let's say, aptitude uh, for athletics or any other kind of team activity, uh, they could do okay on a team because everybody will be paying attention to them. But if they're a pretty good player, but not the star, they have a lot of difficulty. Uh, and they're wondering why they're not getting more attention all the time. Now, there, there is some empirical evidence uh, to support types of personality development within birth order. But uh, this the concept is much overrated. Uh, the reason is that the research really can't support the stereotypes. Uh, because it, it's so difficult to, to, to do the research. Because the, the problem is uh, the, being first or second child differs between, if you're the second child, between were you born a year after the first child? Were you born five years after the first child? Uh, so not only does birth order you know, come in here, but distance between children are probably going to make life experiences different. Uh, the socioeconomic status of the family is going to be different. Uh, if the family has resources, the family may be able to have the kind of help that allows them to be very nurturant to every child. On the other hand, if there are several children and the family is very poor, the, the parents may be very limited. Both parents may work and they may have very limited energy to, to give to all of these children. So while one family of four may appear similar to another family of four, they may not be similar at all depending on, on certain advantages. And, and, and then there are all kinds of cultural influences that research hasn't taken into account. Uh, and, you know, in some families, it's just common that the grandparents live in the home 
uh, as they get older and the parents take care of the grandparents. But the grandparents, in turn, may become very loving and very affectionate and very nurturing of the children. In fact, it may be that the grandparents are more the parents than the parents are. Uh, that's very different than if, the, or there may be aunts or uncles or others in the community. That's a very different culture to grow up in than a culture where there are only the parents uh, or there's only the parent. Uh, that uh, you have one parent and that parent is struggling and trying to make it. So to generalize that if you're the second child or you're the third child, without taking all these other variables into account, really is a mistake. And, and it's, so we never have really developed uh, any solid uh, scientific information about birth order. Instead, we have some of these clinical observations, which probably are true in some cases, but it's overdetermined. And, and you see this too, by the way, you know, Adler tried to, to push this theory and, and he got into some difficulty with it in the sense that the generalizations don't work. He, he felt that uh, if a boy was brought up in a family with, with lots of girls, uh, this boy may well feel lonely and he may find it difficult to have male images. And actually, uh, you know, data show us that, that it's really quite to the contrary. It's quite possible, of course, uh, if a boy grows up in a family and there are several uh, female siblings and, uh, and there are not a lot of male images that the boy may not develop the kind uh, of character or kind of model to seek that might be good for him. But that's not at all necessary. You know, in, in some families where there are lots of girls, the girls having only one brother uh, become very solicitous that the brother should be a boy. And in some families, the older sisters will be the ones who teach the boy to play baseball, take him to his first football game. In fact, model all kinds of activities for this boy about what boys do. So that in many ways, this boy is much better off having these great sisters and having them really encouraging a lot of masculine behaviors than if he grows up in a family where perhaps there are a number of males around and they're all terrible models. So that all he's really saying is, you know, three or four ways you can be a male and they're all failures and they're all undesirable. So to start generalizing, boy, if, if, if you grow up uh, in a family where there are mostly boys and only one girl, or only one boy and lots of girls, that that's going to be negative, that's way overgeneralizing. You really have to know the circumstances before you would ever, uh, you know, want to make such judgments. Okay, now, let's talk about psychotherapy. As you might guess, Adler was a strong believer in evaluating early recollections. Uh, as a way to understand psychopathology. And in particular, he attempted to evaluate what events might influence an individual's personal striving for superiority. And he also utilized dream analysis. In fact, it was a major technique for him. However, he did not stress sexual interpretations of manifest content or latent content as Freud might have. Instead, he examined how dreams might give you some insight and explain a person striving for superiority. So if you notice, the idea for him is that he's looking for messages about how a person is trying to become the person they want to become. And in therapy, uh, Oh, sure. Can we have the slide up again, please? Okay. The, uh, the third technique that uh, Adler used, which we've just finished discussing, is birth order analysis. And, and as I was saying, uh, birth order analysis, you know, is overdetermined, but, it, but it's not, you know, completely useless. That is, if, you, if the person comes in and presents a lot of uh, experiences, and emotions about their siblings, you really do want to listen, and you may get some insights 
about things that happened to a person depending on what they reveal. But uh, if the person uh, you know, tells you they were traumatized by their older brother or they were often beaten up or, uh, and they became inferior feeling because uh, the parents didn't protect them, I mean, those are all valuable bits of information to have. But it, it's more the interpersonal experiences than it is actually the fact that the person is, is second uh, in the birth order. And by the way, the, uh, what's key in this is how do the parents respond to all of this? Uh, you know, you can have one sibling that really feels cheated because, uh, you know, he or she was the only child and, uh, and now they're four and somehow there's this other thing that's come into our lives, this other kid and I'm not getting attention. And worse, let's say that mom had some real difficulties uh, delivering this child and she's still in the hospital. Now we got this thing home and no one's paying attention to me and everybody's paying attention to the new kid. Uh, you can imagine how uh, that older child gets very angry and how that older child's gonna vent a lot of anger on the next child. And that's very important information to have. Now, Adler also worked, uh, and it was interesting, he, like uh, Jung, but even more than Jung, he was a real colleague uh, in doing therapy with patients. That is, he was a person who, who felt it's important that we interact, it's important that I get to know you, it's important that I know your aspirations, what it is you would like to become, and that I listen for, well, what's keeping you from getting there? Uh, what has gotten in the way? Are you one of the types of personality we talked about earlier? And, yes? Like, did you have the same trait? If you were the youngest, did you still have characteristics of being like the second child? Well, he, he didn't, he tried to define that they would be different. That is that the, the younger child would be different than the second child. In fact, you know, the oh, oh, the younger child were the second child. Yeah. Uh, oh, that, that's, uh, yes, he, he would see that some of the characteristics of being the youngest child would be in the second child if the second child were the, that there were only two children. Uh, but he was, he was more focused, uh, you know, he, he took it in larger families in his conception uh, so that when he, if you read, when he talks about it, he tends to talk about uh, the idea that there are several children there and here's the youngest. And of course, uh, we know, uh, you know, as parents that uh, by the time you, if you have more than two children, by the time you have the third, you know, you're much more relaxed. Uh, you're not so worried about being a good parent. Uh, you're not so worried about dropping the baby. Uh, you're not so worried if the baby cries that something terrible is happening. So, you know, the whole idea of the more relaxed parent probably has a real impact on the younger child, and the younger child may be the second or may be the third, etc. But uh, what did not get enough attention in this theory was really the behavior of the parents. And, and, and that's key. Uh, in understanding this. Also, as I mentioned just a couple of minutes ago, uh, the, the whole idea that the birth order is too rigid. Uh, I mean, if, you, if a woman has four children, let's say, in, in six years, that's very different than if she has four children in, say, 15 years. Uh, those children are going to have different lives. Uh, the same thing is true if, if the, uh, the mother uh, has a lot of resources and she gets a lot of help. That's very different than if she has to do everything. And it's even more different if she's alone. And perhaps it's even more different if it's the father who ends up uh, with four children uh, without a mother, and, and, and he's got to care uh, for the children. And the reason I say that, why it might be different for the father, is because society would treat him different than they would treat the mother who had four children. So there, there are so many complex interactions that go on that it's, it's very important that we not get simplistic uh, and I think that this part of Adler's theory, uh, you know, really was simplistic. The other thing, uh, too, that you want to begin to recognize here 
is that for, for Adler, he looked to the future, and he, he thought people looked to the future, and he saw good things happening. And if you notice in, in his theory, it really was the focus on creativity, the focus on achieving whatever it is you wish to achieve in your life, the focus on being able to get to where you want to get that had his attention. And if you went into therapy, it was really because you weren't getting there, so the therapist's job was to help you to get on track, to begin to think about how you can achieve all those things you would like to achieve. Now, that's very different than coming into therapy because you are overwhelmed with impulses, because uh, you can't cope with all the, the rage and the negative feeling that is inside yourself, that somehow we have to help you to develop better defenses, that somehow we have to help you to learn to engage in society in a way in which you won't be out of control. So, you know, when, when you really look at what Adler was able to propose and what he was able to accomplish, uh, he started us thinking about, you know, very positive ways to, uh, to get to things. And he, and he started us thinking about the fact that, that creativity is a very important part of oneself. Now, let me mention that if you notice up to now, we have had three men, all of whom were in the Victorian age. And, uh, and there were lots of stereotypes uh, that, you know, th and I've tried to show you how th these people were, were victims even of their stereotypes. What, what you, th the next person we're going to talk about is going to be Karen Horney who is the first woman psychoanalyst who really made a big impression and developed her theory and really took a stance uh, about women. Also, uh, I haven't mentioned this, but in, in the history of psychoanalysis, there's a lot of conflict, actually, be, between all these analysts. For instance, Freud was bitterly disappointed that Jung broke with him. And it was for a couple of reasons. Jung was kind of the bright young man who was going to be the person who advanced Freud's theory. And, and very importantly in those days, uh, Freud felt he needed Jung because Jung was not Jewish. And it was important to Freud, who was Jewish, because the anti-Semitism of the day uh, made a theory that only came from a person who was Jewish somewhat suspect. That is, it was harder for Jews to put forward things uh, in the intellectual environment of the day and to get acceptance. So if someone who wasn't a Jew was also doing this uh, and proposing this theory, Freud thought he would get more acceptance. So when Jung broke with him, uh, that was a very big loss. Then you find Adler comes along, and Adler breaks with him, and it's even more dramatic. And Adler begins pointing out all these positive things, looking to the future, where, you know, Freud had all of these unconscious conflicts ruling man. Well, now we're going to be moving on, and we're going to talk about Karen Horney, who is going to be saying things like, this theory doesn't account for women at all. And this is really a serious problem in these theories. And so we're going to talk about women, and, and I am going to insist that this theory take into consideration the experiences of women. And so you'll find both her personal history uh, of interest to you, and then you'll find that her theory begins to address some things that I'm sure some of you women have been wondering, when will we talk about these things?